So in this module, we're going to wrap up the analysis of our device-independent quantum key distribution protocol under an important assumption on the kind of attacks that the adversary or the eavesdropper is allowed to make, which is that she's restricted to collective attacks. I'll explain what these attacks are a little bit later. Uh, let's first review the protocol. So here is our um, device-independent quantum key distribution protocol. Let's go over the main steps. So the first step, Eve gets to prepare not only an untangled state that she gives to Alice and Bob, but arbitrary devices. So she prepares these three devices. There's entanglement between the devices, but she also gets to choose the measurements that will be performed by the devices. So Alice gets her device, Bob gets his device, then they start the protocol. At the first step, each of them is going to make a random choice of bases. There's two possible bases for Alice and three for Bob. And here it's important that this random choice is performed locally. So we always consider that Alice and Bob trust their personal random number generators so that these bases are indeed chosen uniformly at random and the eavesdropper has no control over this choice. So Alice chooses some theta a, Bob chooses some theta tilde b, and they use these bases as inputs inside their devices a and b sequentially in order to generate outputs xA for Alice and xB for Bob. They record their outputs and that's the end of the first phase of the protocol. Now in the next phase, they exchange their basis information, theta A and theta tilde B, and they split the rounds into two sets. Half of the rounds will be used for testing, half of the rounds they'll use later for the raw key. So in the rounds that they select for testing, let's call these uh, T, they perform a certain number of checks. Uh, among others, they'll check that the CHSH condition is satisfied with high enough probability or high enough fraction of rounds on the average. If this test passes, then they proceed to generate their keys. And at that point, they perform the standard uh, steps of information reconciliation and privacy amplification that we've seen before. These were the same in all the QKD protocols that we saw. So that's the protocol and let's try to analyze it now. So I'm going to have um, 12 n rounds of this protocol with the goal of generating n bits of key. This number 12 is not too important. Uh, you, you can make it a little bit smaller, but it's going to be convenient for us. So the restriction on Eve now is that she's restricted to performing collective attacks. And what this means is that instead of just giving one general pair of devices to Alice and Bob that they're going to use sequentially, Eve is restricted to giving them 12n copies of the same device, meaning that the system between Alice and Bob, in particular the entangled state that's hidden in these devices, must take the form, instead of being an arbitrary state an or a12n, bn, e, then this should take the form a1, b1, e1, tensor, rho, a2, b2, e2, etc. And we also assume that each of these states is the same and the devices behave the same every time they're used. Right? So every time Alice and Bob use their device, it's basically you can think of it as the same device independently in each round. And this will greatly facilitate the analysis. So other than that, the protocol is the same. So this is just an assumption on the eavesdropper. So there's going to be two tests that the parties perform. The first uh, we've already seen, it's the CHSH test. So they take these test rounds T and there's going to be approximately 4N out of the 6N test rounds where the inputs are X or Z for Alice and H or H tilde for Bob. And when restricting themselves to these 4N rounds, they evaluate the fraction of these rounds in which the devices they used produced outputs that satisfy the CHSH condition and they check that this fraction, which is what I wrote here, is at least the optimum that we could expect from quantum devices minus a little bit of tolerance eta. So that's the CHSH test. And we saw that from this CHSH test, we can conclude because we're using the same device independently each time, we can say, well, this device's probability of satisfying the CHSH condition was exactly this. And from the analysis of the CHSH-based guessing game that we saw, we can conclude that this device is such that it produces outputs X on Alice's side that are such that conditioned on the basis 
theta a being equal to the x basis and the eavesdropper's side information, this min entropy is large. It's pretty close to 1. It's 1 minus some dependency on this error parameter eta. That's one thing. We need to make one more check to make sure that Alice and Bob are going to get the same key. So this was test, let's call it test 4a. And then we have a test 4b, which is that to check that when theta a is equal to theta tilde b is equal to x, then the outputs xa equals x tilde b are equal, except maybe with probability eta. So again, we allow a little bit of error here because these devices will never be perfect. So now the conclusion of that, that we can conclude that the max entropy, this is something that's going to be important just for the information uh, reconciliation part of the protocol. So the max entropy of Alice's outputs conditioned on Bob's output and the fact that they use the same basis, so theta a equals theta tilde b equal x, this will be of order eta. All right? So based on these two things, we perform the steps of information reconciliation and privacy amplification. And we've seen that we're going to be able to extract an amount of key which is the min entropy of Alice's bits that she uses as the raw key conditioned on input being x, the side information. So this is a quantity which will be roughly 1 minus O of root eta times n. So we can get this amount minus some dependency on the error parameter for the privacy amplification step. And we also lose some amount due to information reconciliation, which is going to be proportional to the binary entropy of the eta fraction of noise that we tolerate. So we have a term of that order. So exact dependency on eta and epsilon is not too important for us here. What's important is that we get a linear key rate, right? There's a dominant term of 1 times n, and then there's some extra losses that come due to the, the different steps of the protocol. So now here, it's crucial that I could use independence in order to go from a condition of the mean entropy on single bits that are produced at Alice's side, and this comes from the analysis of the CHSH-based guessing game, to a bound on the mean entropy for all the rounds simultaneously, all the n rounds in which I use the raw key. And this step from one round to n rounds, there's two things that we're using in order to perform it. Let me go over these two things. Because what we did is that our test of the CHSH condition let us conclude this assumption for a single round, right? So we know that we can characterize the behavior of the device when we use it once. And then there's two steps we need. First, what we know is, for instance, so that the min entropy of the bit that's output by Alice conditioned on basis being equal to x and the side information e, this is, let me just say, roughly equal to 1, it's close to 1, if i is a test round. Now we want to conclude something about the rounds that are used for the Rocky, which are the other rounds. So we'd like to have the same condition. And how do we do this? So this is something that we saw before. It's based on using concentration bounds uh, and the fact that we choose the test rounds at random. And because this device behaves the same in every single round, if in the test rounds it satisfies this condition, then it's also going to satisfy it in the rounds that are used for the Rocky. So that's a concentration bound. And the second step is that we used the fact that now we know that the condition on the min entropy holds for all the raw key rounds, but individually for each round to conclude that a lower bound on the min entropy of the total outputs in the rounds that are used for the raw key. And for that, we used additivity of the min entropy when it's evaluated on states that are in a tensor product form. So here it's crucial that we're restricting the eavesdropper to collective attacks, to preparing states that are in tensor product form. This is not something that we could have checked by ourselves. So if we make this assumption of collective attacks, we can perform these two steps and our analysis is complete. Now, if the eavesdropper can perform general attacks, sometimes they're also called coherent attacks, then the two steps are no longer so simple. The first step, we've already seen how to get around when we were analyzing 
quantum key distribution in the non-device independent scenario. Here you can use just a slightly more refined version of concentration bounds that doesn't require independence between the rounds. The only thing it requires is that the test rounds are chosen as a uniformly random subset of a certain size of all possible rounds. And this is the case. And so just using this, we're able to uh, perform the first step. So this conclusion uh, we'll be able to make. The second one is more tricky and we'll talk about later because this additivity when you don't have states of a tensor product form fails completely and you have to use much more elaborate tools in order to be able to complete your analysis. So we'll see that later, but for now uh, we've proven security of device independent QKD against collective attacks, which is already quite a significant achievement.